But what I want us to consider this morning is how it is entirely normal for us as Christians to have big dreams for what we want to see happen in the kingdom. Big dreams, big aspirations. I think that's a part of knowing and loving Jesus is you want to see him made much of. And I think those are, are good desires. But there is a danger we can face when having dreams like that. And that is the temptation to trust our own sufficiency as we pursue those good things. And really that's true in anything we do. Uh, there is a trap laid for us that our flesh is readily in agreement with. And that is to trust our own strength. One thing is certain, God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Absolutely, that is true. And it's right for us to, to ask Him for that grace, to do for amazing things to be done, and to trust that He will give it. That's, that's right to do. But our flesh isn't going to leave us alone in this. In this age, that flesh remains with us, and it will remain there until the age to come. And the desires of the flesh are squarely set against those of the Spirit. And one of the, the things that from the time we're little bitty that we just naturally do is trust ourselves. Trust our own strength. Trust our own sufficiency. And think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And so that will be a constant temptation. And it's a sneaky one. It's so easy for us to slip into self-sufficiency instead of Resting in Christ's sufficiency in the things that we do. But as we'll see today in this passage, when, not if, we stumble. When, not if, we, we depend on our flesh in, in seasons. Christ doesn't change. His promises are for stumbling people. People that, that don't see how little we really are. Even, even with that bit of pride in us, His promises are for people just like them, just like you and me. And this passage today is going to encourage us with the truth that we need to continue on in Christ and to, to continue on this, this pilgrimage that we're on to the glory of His kingdom, even when we stumble as our faith is tested. So as we've seen the last two weeks in John chapter 13, John is focusing in upon the final hours in this upper room uh, before he's handed over to be wrongly judged and executed. He's spending this time comforting his confused, stumbling, sinful disciples. He's arming them with the truth that they're going to need in order to endure what they're about to witness as he's taken from them and nailed to a Roman cross. So turn with me to John chapter 13. We're going to start reading in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time we have to be together today. God, I pray that uh, you would richly bless us through your scriptures, God, as we consider them together. Lord, I pray that you would plant the seed of your good word deep in our hearts, Lord, and bring forth fruit, uh, fruit of, of relying on you, the fruit of, of learning to distrust ourselves in favor of trusting you, God. I pray that you would sustain us, feed us, and grow us in the truth of your gospel this morning, God. We trust in you. It's in Christ's name. So Peter, when he says, Lord, where are, your, where are you going? He's, he's referencing 
something Jesus had said before. Back in verse 33, Jesus told them, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say also to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So he's telling them, I'm leaving. I'm departing from you. And Peter is kind of pushing back on that. He's responding to that question. He doesn't understand. So verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And, and Jesus immediately tells Peter that he isn't ready to follow this road Jesus is about to walk. He has not yet been prepared to, to walk that path. So Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter was not yet ready to bear the cross that Jesus had prepared for his life. And to follow him, though he would someday, as the Lord washed him, just as he demonstrated with his feet, that washing that, that the Lord would continue to apply to him would one day result in, in Peter's ability to, to follow the Lord, even to the death. But that was not now. He still was puffed up in his own estimation of himself, and therefore had no power to speak of. But Peter, and, the, and, and you know, we're not totally dogging Peter here. This is out of love for Christ. He is devoted to Jesus. He loves him. And he has some extremely lofty intentions in this moment. He says, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. But even with those good intentions, intentions aside, again, he's thinking too highly of himself. He's confident. He's even boasting in his ability to follow Jesus even to the death. And yet, Jesus assures him he will fall flat. He had not yet learned to distrust himself. He had not yet learned that, that self-trust is hollow and deceitful and empty, deceptive. And so God was going to allow him to stumble in the, the greatest test of his faith that he had experienced and probably ever experienced. God would allow him to stumble in order to humble him, in order to, to teach him to find his strength in Christ in the future. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. We're so prone to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But what a perfect Savior we have. He doesn't leave us to suffer under silly delusions like that. He is continually at work in us through His law and His gospel, by His Spirit, to, to move our, our confidence away from, from empty deceit to His perfect power for us in His gospel. So this is, of course, a hard statement for Peter to hear. He's no doubt reeling from, uh, from this, this revelation Christ gave that he was going to deny the Lord. But in the very same breath, the very next words, Jesus turns to comfort him and turns uh, to, to, to speak words of, of comfort and uh, mercy to him and the, the other disciples. They are... They're, confused. They are understandably concerned. Jesus is saying he's leaving them. That he's going away from them. But he's, as he's going to show them, it is good news that he's leaving. He's leaving them for their sake. And Jesus is, is, is going to, to thoroughly apply this truth to them. Uh, even though their confusion doesn't help it a whole lot. But let's pick up chapter 14, starting in verse 1 there. Jesus says, and again, last words out of his mouth, you're going to deny me three times. And then immediately he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So again, as Peter still wrapping his mind around what Jesus just announced, Jesus immediately gives some incredible promises to him, to all of them. Um, Do not let your heart be troubled, he says. And the way that the Lord provides in his very next words uh, in order to to endure is, is faith. So do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. To understand and to know Jesus Christ is to understand and know and trust the Father. To know one is to know the other. That's a point John makes clearly over and over again here. So all, all the kindness, all the grace, all the mercy that's revealed to us in Christ, for those who, who need Him and rely on Him, that is the very heart of the invisible God, of God Almighty. We see it in flesh before our very eyes through the words of Scripture. The heart of God toward those who need Him, rely on Him. And so in light of, of the trouble that's, that's quickly approaching them, He's calling them to trust. He's calling them to trust in Him, to trust in His perfect power and His good intentions toward them, even through this that they're walking through, through this that He's walking through calls them to trust even through this trial this biggest trial of their life that's coming Jesus again he is assuring them this departure is good news for them look at uh, where are we at verse verse 2 in my father's house are many dwelling places if it were not so I would have told you For I go to prepare a place for you. KJV, I use the NASB. It kind of words that a little bit funny. Uh, I'm not sure what everybody else has. I know the ESV words it a little with a little more sense. But basically, what Jesus is saying is, I'm not deceiving you. I I haven't come and and shown and done everything that I've, I've I've taught you and and done before your eyes in order to just leave, in order to just leave you alone. Jesus is saying that there is room for even them in in the glory of the age to come. The Father's house is not a one-room house. Jesus, Jesus is the one that earned the glory of heaven. He would be okay to go just himself to what he deserved but what he's telling them is that that is not what I'm doing I'm going for you I'm going to prepare a place for you he's not deceiving them he's not going to forget them he's going to accomplish to finish their redemption that's what he's doing he is ascending to the Father in order to accomplish their redemption. His intention is to share the glory He earned with them and with us. And since He's going there on their behalf, we're given every confidence He's going to return and receive us to the glory He's, he's opened the way to. Unless Jesus is a liar, that that is what he's saying, (laughs) plainly. I'm going to prepare in order to receive you to my glory. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, 
that where I am, there you may be also. He's going away for us in order to finish our redemption. And he will return. He will come again to receive us. As you probably know, there are lots of opinions and theories about the end times, about how how it is that Christ will uh, bring this age to a close and usher in the age to come. Lots of opinions, uh, theories. And no matter where you stand in your views on this, and again, those views, they're not some test of fellowship. We can... We can have different opinions on that issue. But I think there are at least three big elements that we ought to all have in common that we're going to have a hard time getting away from biblically. First, Christ is going to return, and He's going to return bodily. He's coming back in His body to earth. Second, the second element I think we, we, we can't get away from is that return could come at any moment. Jesus, his work is finished. There's nothing uh, besides him finishing the work of of the redemption of everyone who's going to believe. Nothing left to do. He could return at any moment. And the third thing, the thing that we see so clearly here in this passage, and the the third thing that I think that our minds need to be settled on, is his return to is good news for everyone who's looking to, to His mercy. It's good news. You know, there there are there are people out there that would present it as the, as something to fear for for the church, and that's baloney. Christ's return is good news. It's the completion of our salvation, as we're we're raised and glorified with Him. It's the best news. It's 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 our blessed hope in this age. Is, is to look for the return of our Lord, to, to look for Him to come and fulfill this promise, that He will come again to receive us to where He is. He's coming to take us home. And so understanding the, the confusion, the, the hurt, the uncertainty of His disciples as He's telling them He's leaving, Jesus also assures them he's not calling them to like to fumble around in the dark and play, play where's Waldo with Jesus. He's not saying I'm, I'm going away and it's going to be your job to try to figure out where I am. He's not calling them to fumble around in the dark guessing how they can get back to Jesus. He says in verse 4 you know the way where I'm going. He assures them this isn't some mystery uh, that you're going to have to figure out. You know the way. But even after Jesus is being so clear, we see Thomas, he's still confused. Just as, as we saw Peter. I mean, you remember how many times throughout this book so far Jesus has said, I'm leaving, I'm going away from you. And yet Peter was confused and it, it, as though Jesus was saying something new when he said, I'm going away. We just see this continually. Christ announcing his departure, Christ giving such clarity, and then right up next to it, there's verses in between where the disciples are just like, huh? What what are you talking about? I don't get it. This is troubling me. And John, I believe, does that on purpose here. We see Jesus give this beautiful clarity and comfort right up next to the continual confusion of the disciples. And that should be comforting to us. Because that's us. We have the truth. We know the truth. But how often do we forget the truth? And how often when it comes to time to act in accordance with what we know, are we like a deer in headlights? We are weak like them. And so then look at Christ's mercy and His patience with them. He was not ashamed to repeat Himself again and again and again and again. And He would do so and teach a lot of the same things over the next several chapters when they're continuing to be like, I don't get it. 
And it's not till I think the end of chapter 16 when they're like, okay, we get it. You're going to heaven and you're going to come back for us. Just that, that merciful patience of our Lord should, should be a comfort to us. And Jesus answers Thomas's confusion with a verse that we've probably heard many times. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, again, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Again, he's telling them he's leaving and he's leaving on their behalf to finish the redemption of his church. And he's, he's going to prepare for the great finale. He's going to prepare the rooms in the Father's house. I believe that's pointing to the resurrection. He's getting everything ready for that time when it's going to be the end game. When the finale is coming. When all flesh, all eyes that have closed in death will be opened again. Everyone from Adam to the last human being will be raised. And those who are relying on Christ will be raised in His glory. And will be perfected for all time. Something like a growl. Man, there's something coming in here. And so he's going to prepare. And that really summarizes verse 6 well. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Another way to say that is Christ is our entire salvation. To know Him is to know the way to glory in the age to come. Because the entirety of our salvation is accomplished by Him and in Him. From beginning to end, it's Christ. And listen, He is not a reluctant Savior. Even toward weak, slow to understand stumbling believers like Peter and Thomas and you and I. He's not a reluctant Savior. Listen to this. Luke records Jesus in this same scene where he's telling Peter he will betray him. Luke 12, 32. He makes this incredibly sweet statement and it really reveals the heart of God toward us. He said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. God is merciful. He's patient. He's kind. He's full of eternal compassion and generosity towards us who don't deserve it. Toward those who rely on His mercy in Christ. That is His heart. He is glad to give us this eternal kingdom kingdom and the entirety of our salvation is in his hands he has the power to bring it to pass he has promised to bring it to pass and he delights to bring it to pass even for you and I in all of our doubts in all of our imperfections he delights to share his glory with us and he's going even now to prepare for that and He will bring us all the way. Because He is the way, and the truth, and the life. And we are in Him through faith. He was not lying when He said, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He intends to share His glory. Not because of anything we've done, or earned, but entirely because of His baffling grace toward us. What Christ earned, He gives us as a gift. So coming back, coming back to the upper room, the time is, is quickly approaching for their faith to be tested as they're going to witness the arrest and the murder of their Lord. And as Jesus has already revealed, they're not going to handle this test well. All of them will be scattered. 
and specifically focusing on Peter and his boasting, he reveals, you're going to deny me. And again, as Peter is proclaiming his bravery before the Lord, his willingness to die for Jesus, he was promised that as he saw what was unfolding, he's going to deny he knew Jesus three times. Peter doesn't seem to be convinced by this, by the way. As we're going to see later, he seems determined to prove Jesus wrong. You remember when they get to the garden where Jesus is betrayed and the, uh, the officers and the Roman cohort from the chief priests come? Peter whips out his sword and starts swinging in the face of a bunch of Roman soldiers. He's showing his bravery. He's going to prove the Lord wrong. Peter truly did have a measure of bravery as long as he was with Christ bodily. As long as he could see him face to face. He trusted his own bravery. He was shoulder to shoulder with, with his brother and with his Lord, with his master. But when Christ is taken away, when he's bound and arrested, when he's taken to the court of the high priest and interrogated and struck by an officer, when Jesus' physical being is held captive and taken away from Peter, and humiliated and in the murderous intent of those who were bringing this upon Jesus was understood that's when Peter's faith is tested Christ had spoken many words of promise many words of comfort and truth and assurance and now in the face of his impending death would Peter believe those promises and just as Jesus foretold, no, he would not. He stumbled badly. He swore with an oath that he didn't even know Jesus. Brothers and sisters, do you see yourself in Peter? We can have such great confidence in our abilities, even our resolve to do good, out of love for the Lord. But just like Peter, we can think far too highly of ourselves. We are weak. We are prone to stumbling. And our supposed strength is often one of our greatest weaknesses. But consider this incredible thought. Jesus Christ came to save the weak. He came to save the sinful. He came to save those who stumble in times of testing. Remember, Christ announced Peter's denial right before giving him all these wonderful promises in the same breath. They belong to people like Peter, those who are weak. It is to that very stumbling, faithless man that Christ made the promises. And so it is with us. It's not the strength or stability of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith that saves you. Listen to this wonderful quote. It's from a sermon from the 17th century pastor John Owen. A little faith gives a whole Christ. He who has the least faith has as true an interest, though not as clear an interest, in the righteousness of Christ as the most steadfast believer. Others may be more holy than he, but no one in the world is more righteous than he, for he is righteous with the righteousness of Christ. You who have but a weak faith have yet a strong Christ, so that though all the world should set itself against your little faith, it should not prevail. Sin can't do it. Satan can't do it. Hell can't do it. Though you take but weak and faint hold on Christ, He takes sure, strong, and unconquerable hold on you. Jesus Christ takes special care of them that are weak in faith, so that at what account soever they are sick, weak, and unable, this good shepherd takes good care of them. Brothers and sisters, your very imperfect, sometimes maybe even faltering faith 
takes hold of the entire Savior. It isn't your weak hold on Him that saves you, but His unfailing hold on you. It's not your faithfulness that is your hope. It's His faithfulness that is your hope. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.13, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. He has given Himself as, as the pledge of our salvation, and He cannot change and He cannot lie. He cannot deny Himself. His faithfulness is our hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So look to Him and, and keep looking to Him. And here's another wonderful truth. God had a purpose even for Peter stumbling. He considered that. It served a purpose. Not only did it humble him, not only did it reveal that though he thought he was strong, he is very much weak. But Luke also records something uh, that Jesus said when he told Peter that he would deny him. Uh, this is Luke 22, 31 and 32. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and not ultimately fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Listen, God has a design even for the weakness He allows to remain in us. He grows us in grace through our weakness. As, and as we mature in our reliance upon Him, our very weaknesses themselves and, and His faithfulness through all of them are what actually equips us to effectively love our brothers and sisters in their weakness. Our weaknesses, which He sustains us through and which He covers enable us to see His faithfulness toward the weak, toward the stumbling, because we experience it firsthand. And, and Him giving us that clarity of His unchanging faithfulness, though we are weak, allows us to wash the saints with that knowledge. It equips us to approach their weakness with greater patience and humility and compassion for them. And equips us with the truth that the Lord's got this. He's got you. Look to Him. And we can, we can wash one another with that knowledge in a way we never could. Were we not allowed to stumble? Were we not allowed to, to falter in times of testing? Peter could not have heard, when once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. When once you've turned from this denying me, strengthen your brothers through that. That would have been impossible had he not been allowed to fall on his face in his pride. So in closing, I want us to consider, again, Jesus' words in chapter 14, verse 1. Again, right after Jesus reveals Peter's denial, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Did you notice that's a command? The Lord Jesus Christ is giving a command. A command to rest. To trust. What an incredible Savior we have. Look, look at all that He's promised, even just in this passage. All of the great gifts that He's giving, pledged to give to us who rely on Him. And He commands that in that freedom that we have in Him, and we rest our hearts in Him and His promises. What a command. <laughs> Again, the disciples were told this moments before they were to witness the most horrific act ever committed. And it was going to happen to this wonderful, merciful Lord right before their eyes. And yet He tells them, Do not let your heart be troubled. His promises are that sure. We can take Him at His word and rest in Him and His sufficiency. No matter the circumstances we encounter on this pilgrimage that we're on in this fallen world, we can rest in Him. 
He commands us to rest in Him. Since Jesus' command is true, do not let your heart be troubled. Since it's true, they could rest in His promises, even in the face of that. It's certainly true for us. Anytime it seems that the enemy is winning through his many attacks that he wages on us, and through our many moments of weakness and stumbling, do not let your heart be troubled. Look to Christ. 